let me tell you a little bit about what kind of work I do before we kind of uh, delve into today's presentation. Uh, you know, I trained uh, in Bhopal, Gandhi Medical College, then went on to the U.S., uh, at, uh, went to Columbia University in New York where I did my internship, then did a uh, psychiatric fellowship, residency and fellowship at Yale. Of course, I uh, worked with some very interesting people, people who are really world-renowned in the field of mood disorders research. So I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to do some pivotal trials in depression, looking at the neurobiology of depression. Of course, from there I moved on to South Carolina, where I met, wherein I do clinical translational research, which is looking at pharmacological trials in addressing illnesses like depression, schizophrenia, schizophrenia comorbid substance use, which is clearly, you know, there's a very high degree of prevalence there. Uh, do a lot of work in autism too. Somebody, you know, you were talking about autism and we've done some pharmacological trials in autism. Also looking at genetics. Can we really predict who is going to go on to develop an illness and what about response to treatments? So this way you can have treatments tailored. So that's one piece of work that I do. The other more recently was there was an interest from the National Institute of Mental Health, which is a part of NIH, National Institute of Health, in the U.S., wherein they were looking at, when you look at clinical trials or research, it's in a very pristine population. If you're studying depression, you want to look at just patients with depression, devoid of other comorbidities. But that's not reflective of real-world patients. So the NIMH director called in a group of individuals from different states. I was fortunate to be a part of that meeting, trying to establish state policy labs looking at large data warehouses, which captures all of this information, and trying to look at how do we look at outcomes. You know, it could be disease-based, it could be, you know, different things that we could be looking at, psychosocial factors. How does that then inform policy decisions? So we have a couple of NIMH-funded projects looking at that. In the state of South Carolina, we were fortunate to have a grant from Duke Endowment, Clearly, there's a shortage of psychiatrists in the U.S. as it is in India. So in our state, we have about 10 psychiatrists per 100,000 clients. So Duke Endowment provided the state with funding for a telepsychiatry project, which is looking at establishing consultants who will be assessing patients via telepsychiatry. So this is looking at all 65 emergency rooms in the state which is quite truly really fascinating. There is no other state in the United States which clearly has a project of this magnitude. So uh, I'm actually looking at, I have an NIH-funded career award which looks at outcomes, cost-effectiveness of telepsychiatry compared to not having it. We're also comparing it to the state of Georgia, which is our neighboring state, which doesn't have ER telepsychiatry. So just to kind of give you the breadth of work that I do from clinical translational research, which is bench to bedside, and from bedside to the trenches. With that, we'll, uh, Mr. Kulkarni asked me to talk about mental illness, global public health challenges. What are some of the lessons that we have learned and what can we kind of, you know, teach the West? Now, it's my practice to start any talk with a joke before we delve into something as serious as mental illness. So this way, everybody's awake and with me. Everybody knows Sherlock Holmes, right? Yes? Okay. So Sherlock Holmes and Watson once decide to go on a camping trip to one of the parks in London. So their uh, housekeeper cooks them an elaborate meal. They take it with them. They pitch their tent, have their meal, and call it a night. In the middle of the night, they are woken up by a loud thud. Holmes wakes up first, looks around, wakes up Watson and says, Watson, Watson, what do you see? Watson looks around and says, I see the dark blue sky, the silver crescent moon, the twinkling stars, and goes on and on and on. By now, Holmes is at his wit's end. He kicks Watson and says, Watson, you fool, somebody stole in our tent. <laughs> the moral of the story is that things that may seem obvious are often myths, which brings us to mental illnesses. Let me start off by kind of clearly giving you a landscape, the magnitude of this problem. If you look at the World Health Organization stats, by 2020, depression will be the second leading public health concern next to heart disease if it does not end up surpassing heart disease. 
If you look at what is what we call dailies, D-A-L-Y-S, disability adjusted life years, which is kind of captures the burden of an illness, depression currently is fourth, number four. So by 2020, clearly you're going to have a significant problem at hand worldwide. Look at number three on the 2020 list. Accidents. Alcohol is going to be a major contributor. Number eight is war, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as traumatic brain injuries. So if you look at the top ten disability-adjusted life years or burden of illness, three of them are psychiatric illnesses. Go ahead. Global, global numbers, correct. Not uh, I don't have the India numbers because it varies depending upon which where you capture it from. So, so which means we really need to be equipped to detect the illness, make an accurate diagnosis, and then effectively treat the illness. So I thought what I'll try to do throughout this presentation as we are talking about challenges worldwide is kind of, you know, have a common theme. We'll talk about depression because I'm very passionate about depression when it comes to depression. At any given time, there are about 330 million individuals all over the world who are depressed. And this is only diagnosed cases of depression. Okay? We already talked about it being the second leading public health concern. And of course, if you have comorbidities with depression, whether it is medical comorbidities, which I'll talk about a little later in the presentation, that further increases your burden index. What's comorbidity? Two, two, two illnesses, correct, you got it. Now, you know, we've seen a spate of suicides. I mean, every time I pick up the newspaper in India, invariably there is a life lost. So let me give you some grim stats on suicides. 10 million suicide attempts worldwide, 1 million suicide completers. If you look at the United States, 31,000 suicides. This is, we have a suicide registry. So clearly that's where you're capturing all of this information. And I'm sure the numbers are either close or even maybe much higher than this in India. 10 to 20 times more suicide attempts. Okay, so completion is what we're talking about, 31,000. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death, but if you look at the youth, kind of you're looking at adolescents and young adults, third leading cause of death. Is anybody surprised here? I mean, if you look at the newspaper again, you know, school kids, you're looking at college-going kids, clearly this, you know, this number may be very reflective of what's happening here in uh, the Indian subcontinent. What about uh, suicide facts in terms of variations? If you look at gender variations, women go on to make more suicidal attempts, but men are more successful in completing suicides. If you look at age, younger individuals make more attempts, while the elderly are more successful in making lethal suicidal attempts. And I don't know if there is any kind of work that's been done in the Indian subcontinent looking at some of these factors. Uh, if you look at the U.S., if you look at Caucasians versus African Americans, Caucasians, elderly Caucasians, so white men, uh, above 65, have a higher risk compared to African Americans. And we'll talk a little bit about what confers resilience, psychosocial factors, clearly. 90% of suicides are due to a diagnosable mental illness. 90%. It's only the other 10% which clearly could be, you know, just, you know, some kind of a psychosocial trigger that could have uh, resulted in that. So here are the numbers. If you look at major depressive disorder, which is depression, 50% of individuals with depression do go on to attempt suicide. 10 to 15% are successful in completing suicides. Schizophrenia, 10 to 15% successful in completing suicides. Bipolar illness, 15 to 20% rates of suicide. Alcoholism, about 18%. So if you have two comorbidities, let's say a person drinks, also has depression, the rates of suicide go up. And of course, uh, presence of a medical illness clearly adds on to the burden. Now clearly there are myths about depression, that depression is not an illness, it's like, you know, it's a passing phase, you know, so you broke up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and hence you have a reason to be depressed. But we know for a fact that depression is a result of a complex interaction between genes, biological factors, and the environment. 